Brad Johansson, this man right here to my right, is leaving Local 12 after 26 years at the station. Mm. Brad, hard, hard to believe, really. Yeah, they, I, this is difficult. It's a tough time. When you go 26 years, it's a long time, and uh, there will be a ton of memories. It will be very, very difficult to leave. And we thought it was only fitting on your final sports authority that you be the guest of honor on a show you really helped create. Now you came That's your fault. from Las Vegas as a weekend anchor, news anchor, mm -hmm. and you ended your run here at Local 12 as a news anchor, but the majority of your time here in Cincinnati was as sports director, 19 years. Started in 1996, you entered really a landscape in Cincinnati that had a lot of high profile guys, but you built this station and you built this sports department mm -hmm. really to, was something that, that probably you didn't even think you could do at the time. Uh, Steve Minium was the news director at the time that hired me, and he had hired me before actually in Las Vegas, gone to Birmingham, Alabama before he came back here. And uh, Local 12 WKRC at that time um, was bottoms in the ratings. And he said, we're going to build this up and we're going to create a monster. And you know, he was able to do that along with the help of Bill Maul, who was the general manager at that time. And when I moved over into sports, he didn't want me to move over into sports. I had been in news because I couldn't find a sports job. And so when the opening came, I said, let me do this. And I did both news and sports for three months straight while they did a national search. And they offered me the job and said, please don't take it. We'd rather you just stay <laughs> on the news side. And I wanted to do sports. So and you took a pay cut. I took a pay cut because I'm a brilliant negotiator. <laughs> and um, I, I wanted to do the job. And I wanted to create something that we hadn't seen before. So I always had, he always said I was like buckshot. I would just send ideas off all over the place and eventually I would narrow it down to try and figure out what worked and we, we figured out a few things that worked. Well and you didn't really narrow a lot down a lot of the things you threw out there ended up being big successes including the show you're watching right now the Sports Authority the Friday Night Final uh, I've, I've heard you talk um, about the Friday Night Final and the first instance of the Friday Night Final something that had never been done in this market and maybe something that, that shouldn't have been done if the first show is any indication. Yeah, well, I don't know how, whether that lasted the second week just because they didn't have any other program, but the first <laughs> week would have said, okay, you guys can't figure this out. Yeah, the, the graphics didn't work. Um, the teleprompter did not work. The scores were wrong. Uh, <laughs> the highlights didn't match up. I mean, it, it was brutal. And I think that's what you do is you find how you're going to fail and then figure out how you pick yourself up and succeed from there. And from that point, Friday Night Final did okay after a while once we figured it out. Kevin Barnett, the two of you, are our executive sports producer right now, have been great friends for a long time. And it was either his brainchild, your brainchild, but the things that you guys did together you know, the I got next, the child's play. Well, so he's an many, idiot too. Right, that, yeah, that, uh, a lot when, of idiots. When, when you have two idiots together <laughs> trying to work stuff out, eventually you kind of come up with some things. And I, uh, the, the I got next was right out of the gate. I knew I wanted to do that because I always imagined challenging people who could really do something and see why I can't do those things. So we would have people write in, but we wanted to do the goofy stuff. We wanted to make, the idea when I took over in 96 was because the manager said nobody watches sports, nobody cares about sports. So we wanted to make the non-sports viewer care about sports. And I got next was challenging people to games like, I, I don't know, frying an egg or um, horseshoes, things that anybody could do that made it more part of their home. People who didn't feel like they belonged in sports, we tried to come up with some things that made them feel like it was something that could last in their living room and a reason for them to watch. And it was really something they saw you doing horseshoes and said, well, I'm really good at tiddlywinks or I'm good at this. And it, they, exactly. the ideas just kept coming in. We did Twister, um, uh, sock, sock soccer in the living room with a four-year-old yeah I mean we did race walking I think was the first <laughs> one we ever did I did steeplechase and then we ramped it up to the point of I did um, I actually did uh, sprint car and drag racing 
and I thought I was going to die. And <laughs> but you would always take it up to the next level to try and figure out things that people would go, oh, I'm going to watch Joe Anson make an idiot of himself tonight. So, so you started in, in 1996. Was there a moment for you when you had the confidence in yourself, you had some people around you that, that were willing to kind of go out on the limb with you. Was there a moment for you where you said, this is going to work? This is, I'm going to make this happen. Uh, I, don't, I don't ever think I looked at it that way. If I took the job, it was going to work. It was just a matter of how much would I fail in the middle of it. But you could not deter me from figuring out a way. I wanted to win. And winning meant that we were going to put the best product on. And sometimes that had to be adjusted all of the time. So I knew when I took the job, it was going to work. Um, I don't think a whole lot of other people believed in, in, in that, but we would figure out a way to make it work because that was the only option. We're catching up with Brad as he gets set to depart us, heading to uh, North Carolina to rally, W-R-A-L, correct? Yeah, yeah fantastic station in, in North Carolina. Speaking of places that did it right and, and started things of their own, this is one of the, I'm excited to be heading there. Some of the stories that you've done here have just made such an impact and, and for my money and I'm biased I think <laughs> Cincinnati is losing the best storyteller um, kind. in the market the story that that pops to everybody's mind the story that people are probably thinking about right now before I even say it is Lauren Hill and what an impact that story made not only in her life but in the lives of countless others that are dealing with her disease yeah, and that was after I left sports Right. So, so it was it was a sports story. I had left the sports desk and Kevin had gotten the call um, from Coach Bear and he was going through all sorts of things in his life. And one of the things that he was going through as an interim coach was I got this girl who's got brain cancer and she's going to die and I'm trying to get her on the court before she dies. And what I didn't know at the time is everybody had already told a little bit of Lauren's story and it just hadn't ignited. And for whatever reason, the way it played out, and I could go on with Lauren's story forever, but the way it played out was there was just something special about how it worked out, how it didn't work out, how we failed in trying to begin to tell the story, and how it eventually worked out that this was a girl who needed to reach out to people all over the country. And we were lucky enough with Eric Gerhardt and I to uh, be able to tell that story and then decide that we were going to stay with her till the bitter end and you're not supposed to get that close as a journalist to to people and your subjects like I did with Lauren but you know we broke a lot of the rules um, of standard journalism in trying to tell this story because of the kind of girl that Lauren was and how many hearts she touched. When you walk into a story like that and you know how important it could be to, as, a, as a journalist is that a weight on your shoulders? How do you sort of how do you sort of going in and, and knowing that you can make such a difference? How do you how do you think about that? I didn't know it was going to go viral like that. Right. I just knew I wanted to tell the story, and you will hit things like. And I'm old, so I've been doing it for so long that you know in a moment when you see somebody, when you're able to um, spend time with a subject, you, you go, you know, this one. And that was one with Lauren and with her family. Uh, in the time that we were doing the interview, I, I said, this is going to be huge. I didn't know it would be the way it was going to be. I knew that when we told the story here, it would make an impact. Um, and the burden is, do it right. The burden is, this is a story that needs to be told, so you need to be really diligent about telling it right. That's probably the A number one on the list in terms of the stories that you've told and the impact that you've made. I mean, the, the Hills were on the SB stage, mm -hmm. partially because of the exposure that the story got through your storytelling. And, and you still have been active in, in DIPG fundraising and all of that. But what are maybe some of the other stories you've told in your course of uh, a quarter of a century here at Local 12 that maybe have fallen through the cracks that you'll remember fondly? Well, I mean, when I started here, uh, there was, I, I've, I've said many times that I've been blessed to be able to tell the story of angels that I believe were put on this earth and, and they're just different people. Tori Cook was one of the first stories that I told who was a, a little girl who had a double lung transplant and she had cystic fibrosis and um, 
her transplant didn't last for very long, but she was one of those, when you meet her in the hospital, you know this girl will translate across the television screen. And she touched so many lives. For those who have watched for a lot of years will know Tori. And that translated that several years after she died, her mom dropped off a box with a white dress in it that Tori had left a note before she died that said Brad's going to have a daughter pass this dress on for his daughter to be baptized in and it fit my daughter perfectly and I mean how do you explain that and um, you know Sam Jameson who's the double lung transplant that we're following now that is really otherworldly of what she's been through the people tell the stories and, and I will say that till I die it's not only, not only about those stories it's the people in the building if you forget about the people if you forget about caring about the people and it's about the product and it's about the money you've missed the whole point it's about the stories it's about the people it's about touching people's hearts to say that makes me better that makes me feel I can understand or I need to do something or how can I be a part of it storytelling is about making people feel like this is something I need to know one of the guys who you worked very closely with, Dave Lapham, I can see him right here behind me. You were the voice of the Bengals for several years on the Bengals radio network. Your, your coverage of March Madness, I mean, you did so many high-profile sporting events. Any of those moments stand out working with Dave in the booth for so long? I remember, uh, I'll always remember the first playoff game because the Bengals never got to the playoffs. And so that first playoff game was going to be it, and the Bengals, Bengals were going to go all the way. And it was that first playoff game against the Steelers when Carson Palmer went down and um, John Kitna had to take over and the Bengals lost that game and the Steelers went on to win the Super Bowl that year. I, I will always remember that. I, you know, coming into the booth, Dave had done it for a long time. Um, I had not. Uh, we butted heads back and forth and there was a lot of screaming between Dave and I on, on the radio. <laughs> Uh, but it, it was such a blast to be able to do it in the NFL and my first play-by-play -play stuff came in the NFL. Um, he's a man who knows football as well as anybody and you just try and sit back and learn. I did a lot of learning. Thank you so much. Thanks, Brad. Brad. Appreciate it, Ben.